first speaker tonight is Matthew Gavin Frank. Matthew is the author of The Mad Feast and Preparing the Ghost. He teaches creative writing and lives in Marquette, Michigan. His new book, which is out today, congratulations, Matthew, is Flight of the Diamond Smugglers, a tale of pigeons, obsession, and greed along coastal South Africa. That's quite a combination. In his own words, while this may sound moony, I see the writing process as akin to walking through some meadow, trying to follow what I think may be the heart of the book and picking up all of these ancillary burrs on my pant cuffs that demand engagement and invoking the imaginative al alchemy required to associate them with what I may be mistaking for the main focus. Ladies and gentlemen, here to give us some alchemy tonight, Matthew Gavin Frank. Thank you so, so much for having me. And it's such an honor to be a part of this show um, with these three other amazing writers and artists. Um, and just a thank you so much to House of Speakeasy's own Jeff Waxman also. Uh, so in 2016, I was on the uh, northwest corner of South Africa on the Namibian border, an area uh, known as the Diamond Coast. Uh, due to the fact that the landscape there is pretty much dominated by De Beers controlled diamond mines and diamond towns. And I was researching my book, Flight of the Diamond Smugglers, which did, as Lucas mentioned, drop today. And uh, the book is in part about the ways in which trained carrier pigeons were used by uh, so called illicit diamond smuggling rings in the area. Um, and uh, so much so that De Beers had infiltrated local governments and actually had it declared illegal in a lot of these diamond towns to not shoot a pigeon on site should one have the means to do so. Uh, so I was in Kleinsia, South Africa, a small town sitting in a, def uh, in a defunct golf clubhouse waiting to interview this guy, Nico Green. Um, Nico Green was former head of security for the local De Beers mine, and he had since been laid off, and he was kind of rehired back in this unofficial capacity, and he was uh, in charge now of running these anti-pigeon militias, uh, these vigilante groups that would go on nighttime stealth runs, kidnapping people's pet birds straight from their home coops, and taking them out to these isolated spots on the beach and executing them uh, beneath the stars amid the dunes. Um, and so Nico Green walks into this defunct golf club. And when I see him, I immediately stiffen. Um, and something kind of strange happens to my body. And it's because Nico Green looks exactly, exactly like my former tyrannical junior high school gym teacher, Mr. DeSable. Um, and, and I mean exactly, this is no mere resemblance. He is a dead ringer. Uh, six foot six, same flat top haircut, same Coke bottle glasses, same skin tight neoprene rugby t-shirt, uh, same blue striped tube socks pulled all the way up to his knees. Uh, the same too tight little navy shorts that just barely concealed his testicles. Uh, I mean, the only thing that was missing was the, the whistle. And so Nico sits down and almost immediately starts speaking enthusiastically about killing pigeons. And as he's doing so, all of these repressed memories um, come rushing back at me. Uh, and in the early 90s, uh, in junior high school gym class, Mr. DeSable, Nico's doppelganger, lorded over us kids in militaristic fashion. In fact, he broke us into these subgroups he called squads. And we would sit in our squads and we would do our warm up stretches as Mr. DeSable stood at the front of the gym and uh, told us these stories as they pertain to his you know, two main obsessions one of which, oddly enough, was the raising and training of pigeons, uh, and the other being watching trains. 
he, he was also obsessed at the time with the Branch Davidian cult debacle, and so named two of his most beloved pet pigeons, Waco and Koresh. And he would regale us with their exploits as we stretched. And I remember so many stories began, Waco and Koresh were fighting again. Uh, but it was after gym class when things got particularly fraught uh, in the boys' locker room because Mr. DeSably uh, took it upon himself to force us boys to take these compulsory, full nude communal showers in the same large shower stall with multiple spigots on the wall. And um, this was incredibly fraught because we were in junior high school. We were on so many cusps and our bodies were all at kind of different stages of, of changing. And um, the sadly claimed to us that the full nude communal designation was part of an edict handed down to gym teachers by the Illinois Department of Health and he took it upon himself to be its enforcer. And enforce it he did. Uh, he would watch us shower intently um, while standing at the shower's threshold with his arms folded across his chest, his feet like a perfect shoulder width apart. And he would blow into his whistle and issue these instructionals for the proper washing of our most sensitive spots as we would cower under the water and slyly eye the crotches of Craig Kamadeka and Mike Byer, who were the first two boys in our class to, to sprout pubic hair. And as a result, we looked upon them with awe, uh, as if their bodies resembled more those like our, our fathers than they did our own. Um, and strangely, this sort of resulted in in their speeded up popularity in the junior high school, though the, the connection between all of that re still remains unclear to me. Anyway, one day after dodgeball, um, I stripped down as Mr. DeSably commanded and I was about to get into the showers when my heart just started racing. Um, and I froze and I broke out into this cold anxiety sweat. Um, and I had what uh, I know now is the beginning stages of what was to become my first panic attack. But at the time I was just a kid and I didn't know what was happening. So I started to cry and refused to go in. And Mr. DeSably was so angry that he rushed to my side and scooped me up into his arms um, and lifted me all the way up to his chest as if I were some chalice. Uh, and rocked me beneath his face, and I could feel his breath on me. And, and he bellowed, I still remember this, your personal health is public health, before bending forward at the waist and effectively granny bowling me into the showers. Um, I remember skidding across the slimy tile of it amid the drippy calves and feet of the other boys, and I knocked a couple of them over and they fell on top of me. And I crawled out from beneath them and sat in the back of the stall with my knees to my chest and my face in my hands, crying into the steam. Years later, when I was long finished with junior high school, it came out that these allegations were leveled against Mr. DeSably with regard to inappropriate touching of his students. And he was arrested. And he made bail and he was at home awaiting trial. And he woke up in the middle of the night and he went out to his backyard coop and he fed Waco and Koresh their last meal of toxic seed before going out to the local train tracks and stepping in front of a moving freight train, killing himself, of course. And so all of these memories start rushing back at me there um, on the diamond coast of South Africa in this defunct golf clubhouse as Nico Green, Mr. DeSably's uncanny doppelganger sits across from me, still speaking joyously of executing pigeons. And eventually there's a lull in the conversation, this moment of silence and 
my heart is racing still and I feel compelled to fill the silence. And so I need to ask him and I say, Mr. DeSably? And Nico Green stiffens and this guilty look crosses his face as if I caught him doing something wrong. And he says to me, excuse me? And I say it again, Mr. DeSably? And he leans forward and it's as if this glaze falls from his eyes and he stares straight into mine and he says, yes. And I say, why did you do all of those terrible things? And Nico Green leans back and it's as if this glaze reasserts itself over his eyes. And he says, I had to. De Beers made me do it. I was under contract with the company, you see. And if De Beers tells me to kill the pigeons, then I have to kill the pigeons. And so that night, I go back to my rented flat in the desert. And there, for the first time, I have the dream that I have dreamed nearly every week since. And in it, I'm back in junior high school, back in those locker rooms, at the threshold of those nightmarish showers, naked, and the steam is thick, and I could hear the other boys groaning inside as they're washing themselves, and their shadows are elongated like wraiths on the wall the ghosts of junior high school boys passed. And again, I have that panic attack. And again, DeSably rushes up to me. DeSably slash Nico, that is. And he starts yelling at me and tells me that I need to get in there and that I need a bar of soap and demands that I put out my hand. And I do. And he slaps a bar of soap into it. But it's not a bar of soap at all but a live pigeon, and he tells me to use it. You all, this, this dream just always leaves this, this malign film on me. And in fact, I'm telling you this story now through the lens of this dream. So forgive me my waywardness and, and, and forgive me also the fact that I don't really have an ending to this story, uh, except to say that I know the poet Charles Simic oftentimes said, when in doubt, end on an image. And so here goes, uh, tonight, as so far away on the diamond coast of South Africa, Nico Green will likely be executing so many pigeons. I'll be there again tonight, dreaming of him at the mouth of those terrible showers, wherein I'm made to wash a younger version of myself with a bird.